Genesis 7. It's good to be in a little good mood. Amen? We was in my office trying to fix all the problems with our country. And we think we got it all figured out. Our problem is we just can't get politicians to do anything for us. Uh, I will tell you, uh, I listened to something late last night, fell asleep listening to it. Uh, FBI agent tried. I mean, he had everything on Hillary Clinton that the FBI had. Yeah, he turned it in. Nothing gets done. That, that family and others, they have so much. They have dirt on everybody. Everybody that knows them. They got dirt on them. Epstein had dirt on everybody. And he was using it too. That's why he ain't breathing anymore. Uh, but they have a lot of, lot of power still in places of government. And there's been numerous attempts at trying to blow the whistle on Bill and Hillary Clinton. And it just goes nowhere. They got it. You're, you're talking about two people that they run and, and they've been doing this for years. They, they hang around people who are already dirty like them. Okay? And the more power that they get from these people, money is power, politics is power, and it's like they, they get people involved in their corruption. Once they have them involved in their corruption, they're not going to turn on them because if the Clintons go down, they go down. Okay? And either that or if you believe the list, there's a long history of people who were close associates of Bill and Hillary Clinton that are dead Suicide by Clinton, they call it. Because all these people end up committing suicide. In other words, they end up dead. Nothing ever gets done, nothing ever gets said. So they hold power over people by those people's corruptions. The same way the devil does. The devil holds temptations in front of people, lures them along, and through their own lust, he controls them. He controls them. He either says to them, I, I'm going to own you, and, and if you play along, I'll give you everything that you want. Okay? And the people do that. They get everything they want. But they've got to pay the price for it one of these days. That kind of life, I want nothing to do with. Nothing to do with. Genesis 7. So that, that kind of fits kind of where we're going tonight. Uh, last Sunday night, we talked about the, the flood itself. And I told you, study the Psalms. The flood waters covered the earth 150 days. That's what I have up on the screen. That's the exact number of psalms that we have. That's not an accident. It's not just a coincidence. But Genesis 7, verse 17, the Bible says, The flood was 40 days upon the earth. The waters increased. And I want you to think about water in the Bible and how it's used. In, in fact, I'll, I'll just ask you this. Run, run through very quickly in your mind stories in the, in the Bible and ask yourself if there's something that's water-related to that story. Nearly every story. David and Goliath. Where'd David get stones? They were smooth river rocks. Water was there. Okay? Pharaoh the, and the Israelites. Water. Huh? Red Sea. Okay. Um, Mount Sinai. Water came out of the rock. See my point? You start going through these stories in the Bible. Water seems to be attached to most of them. Uh, Naaman goes to Elisha the prophet. What does Elisha tell him to do? River Jordan seven times. Water. Again, water. Okay? So it means it's, it's linked with God's work. 
Okay? The way God does things. You get, the more you read the Bible, the more you get to know God. You learn Him. You start thinking like God. And that's what we're supposed to do. Okay? So Genesis 7, 17, the flood waters, 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bear up the ark. Again, I, I, that beautiful illustration. The ark being lifted up. Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So the ark is Christ, and it's lifted up above the earth. Think about it. We are in that ark right now. We are in Christ. We are safe inside. We're not outside hanging on. We're not beating on the side of the ark, begging God to let us in. We are in that ark, safe, secure. Um, the waters prevailed, verse 18, there it is again, the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. Think of what the, the metaphors the Bible's using, the, the illustrations, the exaggerations. The ark went upon the face of the waters. Think of Jesus, what did he do? Walked on the water. Did Peter do it? A little bit. He did some of it, amazed him, scared him. Boom, dropped down. But he did it. Okay? Think about it. The waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. And in this, you have to believe the Bible. It says all the high hills. Can we leave any out? Okay? Now, we don't know how high the high hills were at that time. We know the earth has gone through changes since then. We know the earth was divided after that. It was split after that. I believe that's when North and South America split from Europe and Africa, okay? The days of Peleg, but it was after the flood. Uh, verse 19 again, the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered 15 cubits upward. Did the waters prevail? So this is my cubit. It's about 18 inches, about standard. So 18 inches times 15 feet, what is that? Come on, help me out here. So 18, huh? 22 and a half. That old man, he knows. Or did you read that in your Bible? Okay, all right. Oh, I know he does. I've worked with him. I've, yeah. Tape measure, Sterling's best friend in the whole world. Yeah. Well, hey, that's a pretty good idea. So, yeah, Josiah said that the giants, that we know there were giants in the earth in those days, so let's say some of them made it to the top of the highest mountain. So God made sure that the water covered at not just the top, tippy top of the highest mountain, 15 cubits above that, 22 and a half feet. Josiah says, is that to cover over the heads of whatever giants there was? Yep. Sounds good to me. Okay. And, you know, think about it. When, you, when, when they look at the fossil record, the fossils all tell a story, but depending on how you read the language of that story. And they say that evolution is proven because of the fossils. In the lower depths, you have lower life forms. They were covered over, petrified. And then, a million years later, higher life forms. And then another million years later, higher than that life forms. So they say that because you see uh, an increase in uh, thinking capacity in the fossil record, that shows that, that all the creatures evolved over time. But I look at it like this. They're higher up depending on their ability to climb a hill to get on high ground. Lower life forms, they don't have it. The higher up you go, which would be humans, naturally they would be at the top of the fossil record because they know to run on top of a mountain or a hill. It's high ground. They know to do that. So to me, that's what makes sense, okay? Study Mount St. Helens. 
They say that all the layers that you see on the highway, you go down these highways and see all those layers where they cut through the rocks. They say that's a million years, that's a million years, that layer is a million years, and so on. Okay? But if you go to Mount St. Helens, we know Mount St. Helens blew the whole side, the north side of that mountain, completely off in about 20 seconds. What happened after that was all this ash and stuff started piling up and it all did it in layers. And you go there now and you see that these layers were laid down literally within months, not millions of years. So that's what you would have. Uh, Chuck Thurston, my medical doctor friend, said, what would you expect to see, see, see if there was a worldwide universal flood? Billions of dead things buried under water, covered with dirt and solidified. That's what you would expect to see, and that's exactly what happened. Because nature, when an animal dies, nature disposes of it rapidly. Right? There's nothing left. So all of these creatures you find embedded in these rocks, not only did they die instantly and suddenly, they were solidified before they rotted because of the amount of water and minerals pressing into their substance hardened them very quickly. That makes sense to me. Okay? Um, verse 21, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, every man. It was a worldwide flood. We call it a universal flood because it covered the entire earth. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Of all that was in the dry land died. And of every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven. Four things. One, two, three, four. So we'll pray and we'll ponder that for a minute. Uh, that were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed upon the earth, the earth 150 days. Father, help me. Uh, guide my thoughts, slow down in my mind, teach your word. Father, let it be a blessing to people. Father, this is what we want. As a church, we want the fruit of our lives to be manifested before all men. So, Father, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. So think of these four. Every living substance was destroyed, verse 23. Man, cattle, creeping things, fowl of heaven. Okay, so the number tells me something. On one hand, we have the gospel. We have the story of the birth, life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. His substitutionary atonement, his sacrifice for sin, his God's love manifested for man. So, on one side, there is salvation, Noah and his family. Four men, four women. God is saving them. On the other hand, there's not, it's not just not accepting the gospel that gets you. It's that God judges those who reject his gospel. There is a judgment coming to all who reject God's offer of salvation. His wrath will be poured out like water. It will be. Okay, so think along those terms. Um, all the people that have heard the gospel and rejected it, they suffer the eternity in the lake of fire. They suffer the torture and the punishment of the lake of fire. Some people don't like to believe that, so they won't accept Christianity on that basis alone. But it's the basis of judicial law in every country that there must be punishment for crimes breaking the law has the law has to have teeth and a sword to punish those who broke the law so here it is with man and all the cattle all the creeping things all the fowl of heaven god is judging them and then anytime you have four you think of what's going to happen in the future there is a fourth kingdom that's coming to take over the earth. 
They're going to, God is using that to pour out his wrath upon this earth. Devils are going to be released both from the heavens, we've covered this, and from the pit. And God is using them to judge every man on the earth who rejected his gospel. Turn to, um, turn to 2 Thessalonians 2 very quickly. Verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. The Bible says that, and if you go look in verse 9, the Antichrist is coming after the working of Satan. Verse 10, with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You either choose your sin or you choose the Savior. But you can't have both. Okay, so and we know from Peter and what he wrote that when and from the typology of Joseph, we know that Jesus, when he died, his soul went to the lower parts of the earth, like he said, and he preached. He preached to spirits in prison, to those who had rejected faith all throughout the days of the Old Testament. Christ preached condemnation to them. You're not only going to stay here, but one of these days you're going to be brought out, judged, cast into the lake of fire. So think of hell right now as the county jail where the prisoners are awaiting their judgment and their sentencing. Then Jesus preaches to those who are in comfort in the lower parts of the earth in Abraham's bosom. He said the heart of the earth. Heart has four chambers. Okay, so there's a picture. Here's Jesus preaching to Abraham, Lazarus, all of those who are in comfort, but they are in prison. And Jesus comes and he sets them free. So now they are in heaven waiting for us to meet them there some, someday. Amen? Okay, with those who have already passed away. So that's, to me, that's the, the analogy that he's giving here. But notice the waters. I, I have it underlined several times. In fact, I missed one there in verse 17. The waters increased. The waters prevailed. Uh, the ark went upon the face of the waters. The waters prevailed again. Again, verse 20, did the, uh, 15 cubits upward, did the waters prevail. The waters took over. They covered everything. And they left nothing alive. When God judges... God thoroughly judges. So now, look at this verse I have there on the screen, Psalm 106. And the waters covered their enemies. This is verse 11. There was not one of them left. Now, in the context of Psalm 106, he's specifically talking of Pharaoh and his armies going into the Red Sea. And once Israel was safe on the other side, Israel, or Egypt follows after them. And God takes the wheels off of their chariots. Now they're stuck there. And then God closed the waters in on top of them and killed every one of them. So I always like to use this analogy, what's chasing you to heaven? Think of it that way. How is God driving you to go to heaven? He's using your enemies from the past. Is he not? The things you did, the sins you committed, the, the bondage that you used to be in. And God let you get into that. He let every one of us get into that to chase us to him amen you see that the water the red sea so think of it like this i think the heavens above us are like an ocean all the stars are all the fish of the ocean swimming around in there so between us and the third heaven where God is, is a vast sea. 
that we look at it now and we say, we can't cross that. We can't go from here to there. You know, Trump started a space force, right? Uh, and here's why, I'll tell you why. NASA was basically the one carrying all of our defense mechanisms up into orbit. And Obama pretty much shut down NASA. Shut the pro shuttle program down, shut it all down. Wouldn't fund it. So that forced us to use the Russians to put stuff. The Russians don't need to know what we got up there. So Trump says, we're going to build our own fleet. We're going to put them up there. And I believe him. Okay? But think beyond that. Because man has this drive to want to go higher, 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 higher. So what if man figured out a way, instead of using rockets to burn all this fuel to just barely get us up there, what if man figured out a way to do what they did in Star Trek? Did you see the logo for the Space Force? It's Star Trek, I'm telling you. It looks like Star Trek, okay? So what, what if we get that ability? What were they trying to do in Genesis 11? Build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Okay, crossing that sea is what's holding us back. One of these days when we leave this world, we're going through that to the other side where our Savior waits. Amen? I'm looking forward to that. The waters are keeping us from that. Okay? Waters and our enemies. The water's there to cover our enemies. Go to uh, Psalm 32. Think of your enemies. Think, think of the things that you did back in the day. Think of the things that almost killed you. The things that wounded you, the things that hurt you. Think of the sins that you're running from. God's using them to chase you to the cross. Okay? He, he does it that way. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. He didn't, he didn't say it wasn't in your flesh, because it is in your flesh. But in your spirit, it's not. Now, this is a beautiful, beautiful passage about what happens when we repent. Sister Pam and I were talking. She said she, she got something good the other day about repentance. I've been accused of preaching a work salvation because I believe that you repent when you get saved. I don't believe in this. Just ask Jesus in your heart and everything will be okay. You got to repent. Okay? Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, the Bible says. And we were, we were talking and I was trying to think the way she was talking and we both agreed. Repentance is, how did we put it? Repentance is the effects of of what God does in you. It's not what you do to get God to save you. It's what God has done in you that causes repentance. If you ever had somebody come to you and say, look, I need to talk to you. And they look at you and they say, I don't know how to tell you this, but you you're did wrong. You did wrong. You sinned, you said this, or you did this, and you should have never, ever, ever done that. If you've ever been confronted that way, I'm telling you, it's hard. But it's good for you. Because what they're doing, they're doing what the Bible says, they're trying to get you to repent. So they come to you and say, look, I, you, need to, you need to know that what you did was wrong. 
You start thinking about it and you go, you know what, I, I was. Okay? That was God working repentance in you. Because he's already willing to forgive you. He's already made up his mind, I'm going to forgive him. But that forgiveness won't come without repentance. So God works that in you, and the result of God's work is repentance and sorrow. God, I'm sorry for what I did. God, have mercy on me. Don't hold it against me, okay? So that's what Psalm 32 is all about. When, verse 3, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. In other words, I'm holding this sin in. I'm not confessing it. I'm not going to repent it to God, and it's killing me. Verse 4, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. I kind of think David here might be thinking about Bathsheba. He knows he did wrong. And for several days, it eats him up. And God's doing that on purpose. So then, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. There it is. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Do you see water in that passage? Verse 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah means ponder that, think about it, pause. Verse 6, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Now, I will tell you that I have had people in this church come to me and confess sins. I didn't make them do it. I didn't force them. I didn't say, I need to know what you did. They just came to me as pastor. And they said, I got to tell you what I did. And every time somebody's done that, I've always told them, I love you. I understand it takes a lot to admit that you've done something wrong. I think you're doing the right thing. And I can tell you, I know God's forgiven you. Because I'm telling you, I have. They weren't necessarily seeking my forgiveness as like they needed it to go to heaven. But in that they sinned, the sin needs to be repented and forgiven. And I've forgiven everybody that's ever told me anything. And will always do that. It's the right thing to do. It's actually biblical because if it's repented one-on-one -on -one, and they're a part of the church, as of that point, it doesn't go anywhere else. It's done. We don't have to have a church meeting. I don't need to tell the whole body what somebody did. Would you want me telling everybody what you did? Oh. As of that point, it's over with. It's done. It is forgiven. And in, and in that sense, this is kind of, I think, this is what Jesus was saying, because he said, you know, if you know, any one of you be caught in sin, somebody go to him, and if he tell it thee and so on, then it shall be forgiven. Then if not, you take another witness with you. And then if not, you bring them before the church. The idea is, is that if they will confess that to you and repent, because right after that, Jesus said, and remember, whatsoever is bound in earth is bound in heaven, whatsoever is loosed in earth shall be loosed in heaven so I think in that sense them coming let's say to me or to you it could be anybody in the church confess that sin get it out clear their conscience you forgave them God's gonna forgive them because who led them to repent that way Holy Ghost did and in that sense heaven and earth is in agreement about this person's sin not that we have, and we alone have the magic power to forgive everybody's sins. But if God drives someone to tell someone in the church that they trust what they did wrong, I guarantee you God's in on that. Does that make sense to everybody? 
So now verse 6. Well, verse 6. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Then he said, surely in what? Floods of great waters. They shall not come nigh thee. Because now, where are you? You're in the ark. And it doesn't matter how high the waters go. The ark always goes higher. Amen. Thou, look at verse 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt, you want to see something? You want to see something? Turn to Luke 1. Now, I'm not 100% sure what it means, but I know it matches perfectly. Luke chapter 1. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Where is it? Um, no, it's not there. Look at verse, let's start in verse 7. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years, and it came to pass that while they executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. No, uh, that's not what I'm looking for. And he shall go before him, the spirit and power of Elias. Um, he came out, verse 23, 24. Look at verse 24. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And what did she do after that? For how long? It's the exact same amount of time the ark rose and the exact same amount of time that the devils in Revelation 9 sting everybody. Five months. Here, Revelation 9, Genesis 7. Same exact time period. And it says she hid herself. Verse 7 of Psalm 32, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Wouldn't it be nice to hear those angels sing? Amen? But the, the idea is the waters, we've talked about this last week, represent the bad guys, all the bad people. Bad people on the earth, bad angels, devils, who destroy people with sin. Destroy families, destroy whole nations, destroy whole peoples and races and families, destroys everything. And God's going to turn them all loose one day. And in that day, we will need to be hid from them. And I believe God's going to hide us. That's what He's promising. So, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. In fact, I won't, I won't, I don't want you to do it. But you can ask yourself the question, is there something in my past that I don't want ever brought up again? Okay? I think probably most people have something that they're running from and they hope that over the years, they run far enough to where it'll never come back up again. But remember, God's using that to chase you to the other side. Is he not? Is he not using the waters to exalt us all? Turn to Psalm 46. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Right now. And, you know, some, some preachers have bemoaned the fact that a lot of Christians won't call upon God until they're in trouble. But I tell you, at least they call upon God when they are in trouble. That's what it says. 
very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Think of the flood. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Old sailors in his old wooden boats, when they went out to sea, what were they most afraid of? Storms and waves. Storms and waves. I mean, you're dealing with boats that are running on wind power with big sails sticking up and a windstorm comes. What's it going to do to that ship? It's going to tear it apart. And they feared those waves. Think of these waves as evil spirits troubling you, taunting you, reminding you of your sins, reminding you of your past. Just remember, God's using that. He's chasing you to Him. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah, ponder that, pause on that, think on that, meditate on that, pray on that. Psalm 58, turn there. Verse 1. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? I'd like to say I judge everybody correctly, but I don't. Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. I didn't have to teach my children to lie. They learned it. They had it in them. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth their ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Let me pause for a minute tell you a little bit about Witchcraft, Satanism. Witches and pagans and Wiccans and wizards and all kinds of that sort. They know that they're summoning spirits. They know it. They believe it. The witches say, the ones who practice elemental witchcraft say that on each element, there's a dragon guarding over that element. And that, and that dragon's asleep. And the, the witch's books will say, you got to be careful waking that dragon up to get him to do whatever magic you want. Because if he wakes up in a bad mood, he's going to come out on you. They draw a witch's circle and practice their magic in that. And the witch's books tell them, you have to be careful to close the circle. Because if you don't, these spirits will get out and they will do great harm. What kind of religion is this? This is wicked. This is evil. They're dealing with beasts. And some of these beasts don't get charmed by magic spells. They don't take the commands of humans. They devour as soon as they're released. Amen? See, I read witch books. And I'm telling you, they tell the witches, be careful. Watch out for these kind of spirits. They'll destroy you if you don't do everything just exactly right. Uh, verse 6, break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as the waters which run continually. There is water again. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let him be as cut in pieces. Remember what a white blood cell does to something invading the body? What does it do? It breaks it up in a billion pieces, consumes the pieces, so that when it's done, it's as if it was never there to begin with. Hallelujah! Amen! That's what he does. Let them, be, let them melt away. This is what God did in the day of the flood. He melted away all of the enemies like they were water. They just vanished. All of them did. Same thing with Pharaoh. Psalm 69. I got to run through this quickly. 
Psalm 69. How much more do I have? All right, a lot. I'm not going to give you it all. Psalm 69, verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters. Waters. Evil spirits. My enemies. My past. The foolishness of my youth. For the waters are come into my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I'm coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. I was watching um, films on D-Day, the invasion in Normandy. They gave all the soldiers, Sterling, a, a life ring or something like that to wear when they got off these boats. They let them down in the water. Some of the soldiers, they, they didn't know the tides right. They got out, and to accommodate all their stuff, they put their life vest down here. And they stepped off these boats, and then they dropped in deep water because they didn't know it was there. Turned every one of them upside down, and they drowned. Just like that. Some of our, some of our soldiers never even saw a bullet. They drown in the sea because they had their life vest down here. That's what I'm thinking of here. Uh, verse 3, I'm weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. People, sometimes God's going to make you wait. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being my enemies, remember this is the floodwaters, being my enemies wrongfully are mighty, then I restored that which I took not away. O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach. Shame hath covered my face. This is you as a Christian. You bear the reproach of Christ. If the world hates Jesus... They're going to hate you. Be willing to accept that and live with that. Amen? Be don't try to make friends with everybody in the world. Don't try to accommodate them. Don't try to compromise for them. Uh, verse 8, I have become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. When you weep, what comes out of your eyes? Water. I made sackcloth also my garment. I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me. In the truth of thy salvation, deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. The pit, the strange woman's mouth is like a deep pit, the Bible, the book of Proverbs says that. She sets people up to fall. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Remember, when somebody's wounded, you handle them carefully. Not to hurt them again. And that's how God handles each one of us. When the waters come in, the waters are our enemies. The waters are the people that... We try to befriend them. We try to do things for them. And they end up betraying us. They end up hating us. They end up despising us. And they don't want anything to do with us anymore. We've got people like that left here last year. Hate this place with a passion. We tried. But remember, those waters are there to drive you into the arms of Jesus. Amen?
That's what they're there for. It's why you have enemies and why you don't forget the past sometimes. It's there for a reason. Okay? I always tell you, never forget the pit that God dug you out of. It's always good to have that in mind. Amen? When you see somebody... And you just look and you say, boy, there's a sinner right there. It's easy to do, right? Cops do it every day. You look at somebody and you can tell there's a life of sin there. Remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. Because you were just like them. Father in heaven, these words are good. They're there to help us. Give us understanding, Father. Show us our life in this book. Show us your ways in our life so we have understanding. We have patience, Father, while we're waiting on you to deliver us, while we're waiting on you to free us, while we're waiting on you to judge this earth and lift us up into your kingdom. Father, we thank you for blessing us tonight with these words. I pray, Lord, that it helps somebody, encourage somebody, lift somebody up. They need lifted up. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us today and speaking to us. We thank you for being our God and for being full of tender mercy toward us. Help us to love being your children. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Good. God bless you. You are dismissed. Out of here.